As we approach the season of Hajj, the season of the pilgrimage, let's remind ourselves of some of the great virtues of our master Abraham, peace be upon him, a man whose very name means the father of nations. According to the sacred historical narrative of Islam, Abraham, peace be upon him, or Ibrahim alayhi salam, traveled to the Arabian Peninsula with his eldest son, Ishmael, peace be upon him, or Ismail alayhi salam. And both father and son built the walls of the Kaaba in Mecca, the foundation of which was laid by Adam, peace be upon him, the first human being. In more ancient times, Mecca was known as Becca, from the Arabic and Hebrew root word meaning to weep. The Quran says in translation, say, God speaks the truth. Follow the creed of Abraham, the quintessential monotheist. He was not an idol worshiper. Indeed, the first house ever founded for humanity, for the worship of the one true God, was at Becca, the blessed, a guide for all people. Chapter 3, verses 95 to 96. It was in this weeping valley that Ishmael, as a very young child, cried for water, while his mother, known as Hagar in Hebrew, ran frantically between two hills, known as Safa and Marwa, in search of water to give to her son. Eventually, a blessed spring was given to her by God, the water of Zemzem, water that flows to this day. The name Hagar in Hebrew is related to the Arabic word hijra, meaning flight or migration. It was Hagar and her son who migrated from Canaan to the Meccan Valley by order of God himself. In Islamic understanding, the Kaaba in ancient Becca was one of the outlying mishkanot or tabernacles of the Lord that was visited by some of the ancient Israelites. Psalm 84 in the Tanakh describes the journey of a group of Israelite pilgrims traveling to Jerusalem who, quote, pass through the Emek Habaka, or weeping, weeping valley, and made it into a well. Now, we are told in the Quran that after Abraham and Ishmael raised up the foundations of the Kaaba, they supplicated to God, saying, O oh, our Lord, accept this from us. You are indeed the all-hearing, the all-knowing. O oh, our Lord, make us both fully Muslim to you, and from our descendants, a nation that will submit to you as Muslims. Show us our rites and rituals, and turn to us in grace. You are truly the acceptor of repentance, the most merciful. Chapter 2, verses 127 and 128. We're fur further told in the Quran that God said to humanity, And remember when we assigned to Abraham the site of the house, saying, Do not associate anything with me in worship, and purify my house for those who circle it, stand in prayer therein, and bow and prostrate themselves, and announce the pilgrimage to all mankind. They will come to you on foot, on every, they will come to you on foot and on every lean mount and they will come from every distant pathway, so they may obtain the benefits in store for them and pronounce the name of God on appointed days over the sacrificial animals that he has provided for them. So eat from their meat and feed the desperately poor. Then let them end their untidiness and let them fulfill their vows and let them circumambulate the ancient house. Chapter 22, verses 26 to 29. So we can see from the Quranic narrative that the pilgrimage to Mecca, with its rites and rituals, has its origin in none other than Abraham, peace be upon him. However, over time, the descendants of Ishmael in that region, the Arabs, began to fall away from the pure Abrahamic monotheism, or Tawhid, and eventually the Kaaba became surrounded by hundreds of idols that the Arabs would pray to as intercessors between them and Allah, whom they deemed too majestic to call upon directly. According to the Quran, there was one more thing that Abraham and Ishmael prayed for at the Kaaba. They said, O oh, our Lord, raise from among them a messenger who will recite to them your revelations, teach them the book and wisdom, and purify them. Indeed, you alone are the Almighty, the All-Wise. Chapter 2, verse 129. This prayer of Abraham and Ishmael was answered by God when he raised the Prophet Muhammad wasallam peace be upon him, in Mecca as a universal messenger. In fact, the name Ishmael in Hebrew, or Ishmael, means God will hear or answer. And so his prayer was answered by God. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the prophet of the Abrahamic restoration. He was the greatest monotheist in the history of the world. The Prophet Muhammad recited to humanity the Quran, God's final revelation. 
He taught us the meanings of scripture by his speech and actions. And like his ancestor Abraham, his theological teachings purified humanity of both explicit and subtle idolatry. This Muslim narration of Abraham and Ishmael building the Kaaba is not mentioned in the book of Genesis, in the Torah. Now, the Quran's judgments of biblical narratives are a bit complicated and beyond the scope of this brief exposition. In short, the Quran sees itself as both a confirmation of biblical tradition as well as a corrective. Modern historians and textual critics have argued compellingly that the sources of the five books attributed to Moses, peace be upon him, were in fact composed hundreds, several hundreds of years after the death of Moses, and then someone around the time of the second temple, maybe 500 before the common era, a redactor, probably the scribe Ezra, collated these sources and created what today we call the Pentateuch or Chumash or the five scrolls, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. This is called the documentary hypothesis and it remains a popular and widely accepted source criticism of the Pentateuch in the Western Academy. Nonetheless, we are told in Genesis 17 in the Torah that God promised to hear Abraham's prayer regarding Ishmael. This, of course, a play on his name, God will hear. God says to Abraham, I have blessed him, meaning Ishmael, and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. Genesis 17, 20. In traditional rabbinical Judaism, the rabbis teach that scripture contains four levels of meaning. This is known by the acronym Pardes, that is Peshat, the plain or obvious meaning, Remez, an allusion or indication of something in the future or foreshadowing, Drash, this is when religious principles or ethics are derived from the text, and Sod, a more subtle or esoteric meaning. And there is an analog to this attributed to the Muslim scholar and sage, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, who said that the Quran contains four levels of meaning as well. The plain meanings, allusions, subtleties, and realities. That is, the lafz, isharat, lata'if, and haqa'iq. Now, just as Muslim exegetes see the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as the fulfillment of the supplication of Abraham and Ishmael mentioned in the Quran, some Jewish authorities also see the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a fulfillment of Genesis 17.20, mentioned earlier. God said to Abraham that he blessed Ishmael, Beirakti oto, uh, that is to say in Arabic, that Ishmael was Mubarak. At the level of the Peshat, the text clearly states that from Ishmael, there will come a great nation, a goy gadol, at the level of Remez, this indicates the blessed and great Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, peace be upon him, who again was the most successful monotheist in the history of humanity. Judaism could not simply ignore him. In mystical Judaism, gematria, or numerological interpretation of sacred texts, is also often considered. Now as Muslims, however, we should take such things with a grain of salt Perhaps there is something to this, but we should not be overly dogmatic or insistent about such things. As one of my teachers said, too much salt on a meal spoils the dish. Nonetheless, some interesting numerological correspondences have been pointed out to me by some of my Jewish colleagues about Genesis 17.20. These things would probably fall under the more subtle interpretive level of sod. In Genesis 17.20, God said to Abraham that he would multiply Ishmael exceedingly. Uh, the Hebrew says, Hirbeiti oto bimod meod. The phrase bimod meod, translated as exceedingly, has a numerical value of 92. The phrase as a great nation, the Legoi Gadol, also has a numerical value of 92. Interestingly, the numerical value of the name Muhammad in Hebrew, spelled memchet mem dalet, is also 92. This, subtly, this subtlety did not escape the notice of Hebrew exegetes. Furthermore, the value of the Hebrew name Abram, the original name of Abraham, according to Bereshith, or Genesis, meaning exalted father, is 243, while Hagar is 208. This totals 451, which is the, which is the exact numerical value of Ishmael, or Yishmael. Abram plus Hagar equals Ishmael. 
Finally, we notice that Gen in Genesis 17, 20 mentions that Ishmael, the son of Hagar, will beget 12 princes. Remarkably, Ishmael is mentioned exactly 12 times in the Quran, while Hagar is mentioned exactly 12 times in the Torah. The famous 11th century Tunisian rabbi in Talmudis, Hananel ben Hushiel, wrote the following in his commentary of Bereshith, or Genesis 1720. He said, we see from our historical records that this prophecy came true after a delay of 2,333 years. The translator then interjected with this commentary, Avraham was circumcised in the year 2047, according to the Seder Hadorot, and the Mohammedan faith originated in the year 4384, exactly 2,333 years later. Back to Rabbi Hananel, who says, quote, this delay was not due to sins of the original Ishmaelites. They had been looking forward to the fulfillment of this prophecy for all these years. We lost our independence due to our sins, however, end quote. Now, one of the greatest challenges of our current zeitgeist is the rise of anti-religious postmodern philosophies. The most infamous of the postmodern philosoph philosophers said, quote, it is meaningless to speak in the name of or against reason, truth, or knowledge. Reason, truth, and knowledge are meaningless, he says. Uh, it's true, unfortunately, we seem to now be living in the age of feelings. As Muslims, I think we can say that reason is limited, but it is certainly not meaningless. Muslim theologians maintain that aql and naql, that is reason and revelation, are not in conflict, but that the proper use of the former former will lead to the recognition of the latter, because they come from the same source ultimately. And I think Maimonides would agree with this. According to the Quran, the prophets of God use logic and reason to appeal to their respective communities, because logic and reason have efficacy. And our master Abraham, peace be upon him, is a prime example of this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in surah number six, in meaning, thus did we show Abraham the dominion of the heavens and the earth, that he might be among those possessing certitude. When the night drew dark upon him, he saw a star. He said, Hada Rabbi, this is my Lord. But when it set, he said, I love not things that set. Then when he saw the moon rising, he said, Hada Rabbi, this is my Lord. But when it set, he said, if my Lord does not guide me, I shall surely be among the people who are astray. Then when, then when he saw the sun rising, he said, Hada Rabbi, Hada Akbar, this is my Lord, this is greater. But when it set, he said, O oh my people, truly I am free of the partners you ascribe. Truly, as a Hanif, a quintessential monotheist, I have turned my face toward him who created the heavens and the earth. Now, don't get the wrong idea, there is no question of Abraham even considering the worship of the sun, the moon, or the stars, as Muslim exegetes have pointed out. This is Abraham's rhetorical argument against the idolatry of his people, the ancient Babylonians. He is drawing out through intellectual deduction or reasoning the flaws of their beliefs. He assents, yes, there is order and predictability in nature. The ancient Greeks called this logos, there is logos in the cosmos. In other words, the universe has order. But natural phenomena also changes. It is mutable. It sets falamma afala in the language of the Quran. And that which changes cannot be the eternal. And if something is not the eternal, then it is created and it cannot be worshiped in its right. To say it another way, that which is perfect cannot change because it either changes for the worse or it improves. But if it improves, that means it could have been better, therefore not perfect. Imam at tabari even says that there is a hint of sarcasm in Abraham's argument here, and this adds to its rhetorical power. As if to say, come on, you know better than to worship mutable celestial bodies, worship the immutable supernatural creator. And of course, one of the names of God in the Quran is As-Salam, the perfect. And there, can, and there can only be one perfect being, because in order for two beings to differ, there must uh, exist a lack of something between them. In other words, if I know something, if, if I know something that you don't, and vice versa, then neither, neither one of us is perfect. Neither one of us can be described as as-salam. There's deficiencies in our knowledge. 
If a skeptic were to posit two perfect beings, then we could ask, well, which one has power over the other? One of them? Both of them? Neither one of them? Every answer is wrong, and we come to a logical impasse. Elsewhere, the Quran says, have you not considered the one who debated with Abraham about his Lord? Because Allah had given him sovereignty. And according to a few exegetes, this king was Nimrod, the king of Babylon. When Abraham said, my Lord gives life and causes death, the king said, I give life and cause death. And then the exe exegesis says that this king, he called for two slaves and he killed one on the spot and he released one on the spot. Abraham responded, truly Allah brings the sun from the east. Bring it then from the west. Then he who disbelieved was confounded and Allah does not guide a wrongdoing people. Chapter two, verse 258. In this debate, Abraham points out the limitations of human volition or choice. Nimrod claimed to be God. In fact, many exegetes say that he was the first man in history to make such a claim. Perhaps this is why the word Nimrod in modern English slang means an idiot or a fool. If Nimrod is limited in his choices and potential, then he is not perfect. If he's not perfect, then he is ontologically, that is essentially, uh, inferior to a true deity. Therefore, his mulk, his sovereignty, could not have originated with him. It was given to him. And atahu Allahu al-mulk, as the Quran says. Abraham demonstrates this quite dramatically by demanding Nimrod to bring the sun from the west. Essentially saying, you think you have power over life and death? Let's see you have power over the sun. This is easy for Allah because Allah has absolute unrestricted, unrestricted volition within his nature. Allah is omnipotent. This is one of his qualitative attributes. Inna Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. Nimrod has no rejoinder in this debate. Finally, we're told that Abraham, peace be upon him, destroyed the idols of his people. He was a younger man at this time, living in the city of Ur in ancient Mesopotamia. Abraham said to them, do you worship that which you carve? Allah created you and your actions. Wallahu khalaqakum wa ma The argument here is, how can something that you made be worthy of your worship? It only exists because of you. You are its efficient cause. Thus you are greater. Yet Allah made you. Thus Allah is greater. And since Allah is the only real creator, because there can only be one creator, or else we are stuck in the intellectually repugnant paradox of infinite regress, since Allah is the only real creator, and what Avicenna called the efficient cause of all creation, then only he is worthy of worship. I'll end this uh, with a quick reading of the famous passage in the Quran, which describes the dream of Abraham, peace be upon him, to sacrifice his son. This will bring us full circle uh, back to the Hajj, inshallah. So God says, starting in chapter 37, verse 99 of the Quran, وَقَالَ إِنِّي ذَاهِبٌ إِلَى رَبِّي سَيَهْدِينَ Abraham said, I will migrate for the sake of my Lord. Soon he will guide me. رَبِّي هَبْلِي مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ فَبَشَّرْنَاهُ بِغُلَامٍ حَلِيمٍ O oh my Lord, bestow upon me righteous offspring. So we gave him glad tidings of a forbearing son. Interestingly, the son is not named here in the Quranic discourse. Imam at tabari said it was Isaac, while most commentators said Ishmael. This is not so important for us as Muslims. The importance of the story is its ibra, its lesson, principle, or salient point. Uh, we shouldn't allow ourselves to get caught up in identity politics and ignore the bigger picture. When the son had reached the age of serious work, Abraham said, Oh, my dear son, I keep seeing in my dreams that I am sacrificing you. And the verb here is in the imperfect tense, which suggests that Abraham was continuously having this dream. What do you think about that? He asked his son. The Arabic literally says, look, what do you see? In other words, are you having the same dream? Because Ishmael was also a prophet. In Genesis 22, the so-called Aqeidah passage, Isaac does not know what is happening. He asks his father, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? The Quranic account is a bit different. 
The Quran continues, قَالَ يَا أَبَتِي إِفْ عَلْمَا تُؤْمَرْ سَتَجِدُنِي إِنْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ مِنَ الصَّابِرِينَ He said, the son said, O oh my dear father, do what you are commanded. You will find me, if God wills, from the patient ones. فَلَمَّا أَسْلَمَا وَتَلَّهُ لِلْجَبِينَ Then when they both submitted their wills, and Abraham laid him down on his forehead, وَنَادَيْنَاهُ أَيَّا إِبْرَاهِيمُ And we called out to him, O oh Abraham, قَدْ صَدَقْتَ الرُّؤْيَا إِنَّ كَذَلِكَ نَجْزِ الْمُحْسِنِينَ You have been true to your vision. Indeed, this is how we reward the doers of good. Imam al-Razi, one of the great exegetes, he said that by demonstrating complete obedience to God, Abraham, peace be upon him, was true to his vision, fulfilled his vision. This is what God ultimately wanted, a willingness to obey not the actual sacrifice of Abraham's son. Indeed, this was an evident test. You see, the ancient pagans used to sacrifice their children as a demonstration of their obedience to their false gods. God tested Abraham, saying, in essence, do you love me enough to be willing to sacrifice your son if I asked you? Your love for me, the one and only true God, should exceed the love of the pagans for their false gods. Abraham passed the test. Multiple exegetes mention that Satan appeared to Abraham while going to the place of sacrifice with his son and tried to convince Abraham to disobey God. So Abraham picked up a handful of pebbles and threw them at Satan. This is commemorated at the Hajj in Mecca by pilgrims who symbolically reenact the event by throwing pebbles at pillars called the Jamarat. وَفَدَيْنَاهُ بِذِبْحٍ عَظِيمٍ the narrative continues, وَتَرَكْنَا عَلَيْهِ فِي الْآخِرِينَ سَلَامٌ عَلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمٌ And we ransomed him, his son, with a great sacrifice. And we left him thus to be remembered among later generations. Peace be upon Abraham. The commentary says that an angel brought a ram to be sacrificed in the place of Abraham's son. And so the substitution of a ram for Abraham's son serves as the basis for the ritual of the slaughtering of an animal that is required as the final rite of the Hajj. This is called the Udhiyya or Qurbani. So to summarize and end, the great virtues of Abraham are many. He was a monotheist par excellence, the great iconoclast. He was a model of faith and obedience to God. He was a man of supreme intelligence, reason, and rational discourse. He was a man of empathy and concern for the plight of humanity. And finally, his millah, or tradition, was restored and universalized by his noble descendant, the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, the final messenger of God and prophet of the Abrahamic restoration. May God the Almighty bless all of you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.